precious woman of God. And I do, first of all, before we do make a demand on the Glory Reservoir and her, I want to I thank the precious people that came to support her. You have no idea what that means, um, you know, to someone who ministers. It means a lot when people support you. Amen. And so thank you so much for coming and to support her. So right now, Father, we thank you and we praise you for this awesome treasure and gift that you've entrusted to this body for this season. And God, we, we uh, uh, acknowledge it and don't take it for granted. But Lord, we appreciate it. And we make a demand on the glory reservoir in her. And Father, we thank you that it'll break forth like a dam that's burst. And it'll be refreshing waters of glory to just flow upon the people. And Father, I thank you that not one of us can leave this place the same after she opens her mouth. Now, Lord, I thank you that as this water refreshes and blesses us, it will come back to refresh and bless her, and we will forever give you the praise. We made that covenant, Carolyn and I, in front of these people. You and you alone receive all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. All right, now say, Carolyn, Carolyn. we love you. Amen. Do what God tells you to do. Thank you again for those that did come and to support me. And thank you again, Lady Venetia and Pastor Tyrone, Pastor Tyrone and Lady V for this opportunity. Um, you guys know how I like to open. Repeat after me. God is exalted. The devil is defeated, and we have the victory. God is exalted, the devil is defeated, and we have the victory. All right, that sounds good. All right. Go with me, if you will, to Judges chapter 6, verse 11 through 21. We're going to do King James Version, and when you get there, please stand. I promise I read quick. All right. And Raven, you can just go. Judges 6, verse 11 through 21. And we'll just go one after the other. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was or in Orphra, that pertained unto Joash the Abizrite, and his son Gideon threshed, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thy mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers had told us of? Saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might. In other words, work your measure. That's the title of today's message. Work your measure. And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot and brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth, and he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, you have full reign in this place. You've already demonstrated your power. And so, Lord God, I pray that you would open our eyes to see 
open our ears to hear and open our hearts to receive what you would have for us to receive. Lord God, I thank you for dispatching warring angels to protect the word as it goes forth so that it can take root in our hearts. And Lord, I decrease as Jesus the teacher takes uh, precedence and increases in me. And I have one final request that no one leaves unseen, unfed, or unchanged in Jesus' name. As you sit down, look at somebody and say, work your measure. Work your measure. That's the title today. All right. So yesterday, my mom and um, her acquaintance, we were on the phone, and she said, oh, mom said I, she's a good kid. She was talking about me. And I was like, all right, like that, like in agreement. And so she said, girl, I didn't know you were so conceited. And she didn't say it like in a mean way. It was kind of like a ha 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 thing. And so what I had said to her was like, no, what it is, is it took me a while to see what other people saw, or most importantly, what God sees about me. So if she says I'm a good kid, I'm going to take it. So it took, it took me a while to see what other people saw. And now that I see it, I can't unsee it. So that's pretty much the, the, Focal point of this message, once you believe what God says about you, because that's what's most important, because people can change, but once you believe what God says about you, it is easier for you to work your measure. You can't unsee it once you see it. So once you see what God says about you, it's easier for you, you let it take root, it's easier for you to work your measure. All right? All right. So I asked the Lord, what was the point of today's message? Or what is he coming for? I always ask him, like, what are you coming to do or coming to say? And so he said, I'm coming for their insecurities because it does not profit them or me. I am coming for, he is coming for our insecurities because it does not profit us and it does not profit God. So if we go back to the text in Gideon, um, in Judges, Here we see three times after the spirit of the Lord had affirmed Gideon, he still had to see if this was for real. I get it. He had legitimate concerns. He already started off in verse one. He was hiding. He was threshing wheat where they pressed wine. One does not have to do with the other. He was already in hiding. He was questioning from a place of fear, disappointment, and insecurity. If you go back to the verses, if you go back to verse 13, he says, Lord, if you're with us, why is this happening to us? He was disappointed. The God of my ancestors did this, but this is what I'm looking at. He was disappointed. And then if you go back to verse 14, the Lord looked upon him and said, go in this I might. In other words, what we're saying today in 2023 is work your measure. Thou shalt save Israel from him. Um, from the hands of the Midianites, and I sent you. Even then, he's like, but I'm the weakest one in my family, or I'm the lesser than in my family. And so we see three times where God affirms him, you're a mighty man of valor, you're going to do this, you're going to work this out, I'm going to be with you, I sent you. He's still like, but are you sure? (laughs) And sometimes, has anybody ever been in that situation where they're like, God, I know you said this, but... I know you said this, why? I know you said this, but who? Are you sure it's about me? Are you sure? Because if we walk down memory lane, I got about 100 reasons why it shouldn't be me. But God still, in his sovereignty and his mercy, that's the beautiful thing about God, he knows the beginning from the end, but he still chose us. And that's the beautiful thing about God. So if we go down, let's see. So he was questioning from a place of fear, disappointment, and insecurity. And yes, we've all been there, right? Why do we do this? So we're going to park here for a moment. Holy Spirit said he was coming for insecurity, and so this is what we're going to talk about for a portion of our time together. Insecurity is uncertainty or anxiety about oneself, lack of confidence, or the state of being. Um, Some synonyms for it is loose, rocky, shaky, flimsy, open to danger or threat, lack of protection. I read a Christian article about insecurity when I was um, getting prepared, 
And the writer made a statement, and I'm um, paraphrasing, but in so many words she said, if you battle with insecurity, I'm not talking about one time you're like, oh my gosh, I don't really think I look nice in this dress. I'm talking about day in, day out, it's stifling you, it's paralyzing you. If you battle with insecurity on a consistent basis, you are indeed having an identity crisis. This is for the believer. If you consistently are unsure about everything, God said, you are called to open the door, right? Say that. You're supposed to be an usher. But are you sure? Are you sure that I can do, are you sure that I can handle this? I don't really like people. I don't, if we're unsure about everything, even though what's in the book is everything is God's love letter to us, God's promises to us, what God thinks about us, who he says we are, and we're still unsure, we may be having an identity crisis. I, um, one of my, one preacher that I listen to often, his name is Dr. Darius Daniels, he often says in in his messages, perhaps the same spirit that encourages pride also encourages insecurity. We have two extremes. Pride, I'm better. I know everything. I'm all that in a bag of chips, if you will. And then you have humility. I'm nothing without Christ. Or I have everything because Christ gives it to me. And then you have insecure. I'm nothing. That's not humility. (laughs) That's not humility. Dumbing yourself down to fit in other people's containers is not humility. So hear me by the Spirit when I tell you this. If you are insecure, there is a potential, you have the potential to open yourself up to potential danger. I'm not saying automatically you're going to fall into a trap, but what I'm saying is it's easier to do that. It's easier to open yourself up when you are insecure. You want proof? Let's get proof. 1 Peter 5 and 8. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about to see who he may devour. If you are insecure, you are not being sober and vigilant. Insecurity has caused a lot of trouble. This is why some of us, even in the past, have entangled ourselves with people and relationships and friendships that meant us no good. This is why some of us have accepted less than when we were worth more. This is why some of us, this is not for everybody, this is why some of us have self-sabotaged our own self or stunted our own growth. We have to take accountability for our part of it. God has put it in the word who you are in Christ, and if you don't take hold of it, you open yourself up to danger. The enemy studies you. The way that Christ, um, the way that God has made a plan for you, the enemy has a plan as well. So with his plan, so all he can do is mimic God. So if God's plan is for you to have a prosperous life, his is for you to have a horrible life. If God's plan is for you to Uh, touch the nations. His plan is to try to kill you before you get a chance to even get anywhere. And so um, while we have, um, I mean, you can't blame everything on one person, whatever the case may be, but take responsibility. If I keep going in these cycles over and over and over and over again, what is going on with me? It's a cycle. Because if you look back for a moment, what is it that keeps pulling you in a certain direction? He studies you. So this is why you'll find the same uh, spirit, but in a different person, in a different makeup. You'll find the same uh, situation around, but it's different people because the enemy is like, oh, I know what she like. I know what he's into. I know the type of friend group that they are around. And so we have to take accountability and ask God to shut down any, to reveal to us any insecurities that we have, whether we think they're big or whether we think they're small. Ask God to show you what they are so that you can be closed. So you can be protected, rather, so that you can be covered. There are many times... Okay, so different ways of insecurity. Self-sabotage our own self, stunted our own growth, and repeated cycles over and over and over and again. And that's what insecurity looks like. Not showing up or getting in your own way. There are many instances in the scripture that fear, insecurity, or inadequacy reared its ugly head. 
For instance, when God originally called Moses and Moses reminded him that he was slow of speech. Or when the spies came back and said that they were grasshoppers in the giant's eyes and in their own. Or when God promised Abraham and Sarah a son and Sarah laughed. And then they went to help God. And that's why we have Ishmael. Or when God told Jeremiah that he knew him and that he was called before he was in his mother's womb, and he replied, but I'm too young. Or when the servants were given the talents and the one had one hid. The one that had one hid it. But how many of you know that insecurity is no match for the believer? Okay, let me try it again. But how many of you know that insecurity is no match for the believer, the child of God, the called out one, the joint heir with Christ. Am I talking to anybody? The head and not the tail, the one that's above only and never beneath, the one who has the mind of Christ, the one who is his beloved, his elected, his anointed, his appointed, his chosen, the chosen, his possession, the apple of his eye, his masterpiece. If you think about it for a minute, One of my favorite identities or who I am in Christ is his masterpiece. Because when you think about it, when you go back to the creation story, everything that he made, he spoke it. Let there be light, let there be fish, let there be water, let there be this, that, and the other thing, right? And then when he said, make man, he said, let us go and make man in our image. And so he got down in the dirt for us. He put, got his hands dirty. He used his hands. He didn't say, oh, here's a man, here's a rib. No, like he took his time. He took his time with you. He took his time. Like he couldn't just throw this together. This is like a Bob Ross. You remember Bob Ross doing the paintings? He was real like intricate with it. Like I'm going to put this and I'm going to make her look like this and I'm going to do this with him and then I'm going to breathe the breath of life into him. This is what this is what God did when he took his time with you. So you can't just treat yourself any kind of way. You're his masterpiece. You can't just treat your neighbor any kind of way. They are his masterpiece. He took his time with with you. He knew the plan. He had a plan. He knew the plan. And and so funny thing about God is that he'll uh, show me a message that's not even here. And so I already know next time I speak, we're going to go over the whole God's plan thing because it's really, really cool with me. It's really, really cool to me. But as a ma- like a masterpiece, his prized possession, the best, uh, if you were at an art gallery, the best thing Picasso had to offer, like You are even better than that. Like, God took his time. He knew your ins and outs, your idiosyncrasies, the things that you don't talk to people about, the things that make you feel how you feel. But he chose you. He called you. He anointed you. He appointed you. And he said, you're the apple of his eye. We're not talking about a piece of land. We're talking about people. We're talking about God's people. And, um, yeah, that's like my favorite, that's my favorite one. If you said like, what's your top of, uh, your identity in Christ is masterpiece. Cause he got in the dirt with me. So there's nothing that I can do that's too ugly that he won't come down and get me from. David said, if I make my bed in hell, he's there with me. He's that good. He's that type of God that will get down in the trenches with you. And he'll say, no, you're mine. I'm going to clean you up. Because you have something to do. That's my God. Okay. That's my God. That's my God. All right. All right. So let's work our measure, guys. But when you, so when, this is what happens when you work your measure. When you work your measure, you can do great exploits. When you work your measure, you can part the Red Sea. When you work your measure, you can decree a thing and it be established unto you. When you work your measure, you can deliver your family. When you work your measure, you can feed the multitude with your two fish and five loaves of bread. When you work your measure, you have power to tread on serpents and scorpions, lay hands on the sick, and see them recover. When you work your measure, you can walk in divine health, wealth, and wholeness. When you work your measure, other people can be blessed through you. When you work your measure, it's contagious. Other people want to do what God's called them to do because you do it. Other people want to flow because you flow. Other people want to do what thus saith the Lord because that's what you do. It's, it's more than just I'm called with a 
mic, it was a platform. God has called other people to do different things. We have nurses. We have doctors. We have leaders. We have um, teachers. Like, there's a million and one different things that God can call somebody to do. Everybody's call is not a microphone and a platform. And sometimes I wish, okay, I'm not going to say that. Okay, sometimes it would be easier if that was not necessarily the thing that he called me to do because when, sometimes when you go through life, here we go. <laughs> sometimes when you go through life, people, um, and it may not even be intentional, downplay what God has called you to do. Sometimes people can downplay it. And so if you're ever in a situation where you have to dumb down who you are to fit into somebody else's container, you probably shouldn't be there. That's one thing. You probably shouldn't be there. But because I made a vow to the Lord, I have to work my measure. And so do you. So for the person who felt like um, I'm not good enough, you are. For the person who, think, who thought that maybe my words are not eloquent enough or I can't do this, if you're in the book, you're in the book. It doesn't matter. It's what God says about you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. When we were at Woman Evolve, they had this um, t- uh, different vendors who had different things, and I saw this ring, and I was like, that's my verse. Like, I have, I have to get it. So every day I wear this ring as a reminder that I can do, no matter what's going on, no matter who's saying what, no matter how I feel, because not always outside people, and sometimes it's us. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He empowers me to do what he's called me to do. He empowers me. He empowers you to do what he has called you to do. All right? All right. So how, I'm almost done. So how do we walk free from insecurity? Remember who you are in Christ. And sometimes it's easier said than done. But you can easily Google, who am I in Christ? And they'll give you a hundred and something odd scriptures that you can read it, say it, pray it, rehearse it, and then at some point it's going to take root and you'll believe it. So for instance, when, um, so so for instance, if you're going through a certain situation and you're like, I don't really know how this is going to work out, one of the verses is we are joint heirs with Christ. So you would read it, right? Then you would say, I am a joint heir with Christ. And then you would pray it. Lord, I'm praying according to your word that I am a joint heir with you. So as I partner with you, help me do X, Y, and Z. That's how you do it, all right? So you pray it, you rehearse it over and over and over again. So I've gotten down that I am God's masterpiece because that is my verse. And I I believe it. That's just the bottom line. Next, how do you work your measure? How do you work your measure? Mark the moment. Gideon made an altar and made the sacrifice to the Lord. That's where we find that God is Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. Gideon made an altar, so you're going to mark your moment. Mark the moment that he called you, that he spoke to you, that he gave you a vision for your future. There will be many moments. Mark them all. This is what you hold on to when storms come and when your purpose is in question or when what you see right now doesn't line up with what he showed you. So, for instance, there was a moment, and I like to write stuff down. There was a moment, September 14, 2021, after I spoke, Pastor, Holy Spirit through Pastor said, I live in your voice. So after that, There should be no question for me that God speaks to me. There should be no question. But sometimes it's a question. So when I have a question, okay, Carolyn, get it together. God said he lives in your voice. So yes, you have something to offer. Yes, I do give, yes, I do speak to you. Yes, I do show you things. Yes, I do give the word to you. So I live in your voice. I, um, so you do have something to offer. 
That's what it is. So mark the moment. There will be a lot of moments. There will be a lot of times that God will show you something, say something to you, call you to do something different, switch the plan up that you made up, but then he changed something else. That's what he does. But you have to mark the moment because life happens. Things happen. Situations come up. Culture says one thing. God says something else. People say one thing. But at the end of the day, all we have is God's word and his presence. That's all we have to stand on, God's word and his presence. So what was the last thing he said to you? Think about it. What was the last thing he said to you? Did you do it yet? What was the last thing he said to you? Did you do it yet? If not, do it. The last thing, which I kind of just said, Number two is be obedient. This is how you work your measure. Number one, you mark the moment. Number two, you be obedient. Be obedient. The Bible then goes on to say that Gideon and his servants did as the Lord said unto them. Did as the Lord said unto him. Finally, Gideon agreed with what God said. So then he did what God told him to do. Working your measure is going to cost you everything you've got. But how many of you know that it's worth it? A lot of times what we think or what we take as a loss is not really a loss. It's God uh, moving things out of the way so that he can give you something better. But you still have to work your measure. You still have to do what God tells you to do. You still have to put the work in. You still have to sacrifice. When When Gideon made an altar unto the Lord, he also made a sacrifice. You have to put something down so that you can pick up what God is calling you to do. You have to put something down. I don't know if it's a person. I don't know if it's a place. I don't know if it's a thing. But you have to put something down so that you can pick up what God is calling you to do. How can you work your measure when your hands are full with stuff that is not what he gave you? How can you work your measure when you are distracted, when you are turned around and focused on things behind you? How can you work your measure if you are not sober and vigilant? How can you work your measure? What was the last thing that God told you to do? Did we do it? Many of of you know that it's worth it. And also, God will repay. He will. And that was actually in my notes. So when you said it, I was like, God, like he's really talking. Because... We, we take things, we think that things are a loss. And yes, it will cost you, but it's, it's called a sacrifice. You know, like sacrifice to praise, sacrifice. You put something down, God give you something else. That's, that's what it is. That's what it is. So the last verse that I wanted to leave you with is Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. And this is a different version, CEV. I'm not 100% sure what that is, but it's a different version. We have everything we need to live a life that pleases God. It was all given to us by God's own power. When, he, when we learned, he had invited us to share in his wonderful goodness. God made great and marvelous promises so his nature would become a part of us. Then we could escape our evil desires and the corrupt influences of this world. Um, a few years ago, during COVID and different things, when everything was, again, unsure, right? Holy Spirit said, don't let current events psych out, psych you out of what I promised you. Don't let current events psych you out of what I promised you. The same applies to you. Don't let culture, people, yourself, psych you out of what God promised you. Work your measure. Amen. It's a word, baby. You preach that, you preach that word, man. You know, Carolyn, what you said is so true. You said, 
all we have is God's word and presence. You know, you know, everybody is celebrating you, and we love you because you're such an awesome minister of the gospel. And I will never change. I will always love you and celebrate you and support whatever God has for you. But you're right. People are fickle, and people can change. And one day they love you, and the next day they don't. One day they think well of you, and the next day they think you're nothing, you know, kind of thing. And so, uh, but you said something so powerful. You said all we have, all we really do have is God's word and presence. Thank God for your children. But your children can go wacky. Thank God for your husband or your wife. They can go wacky. All you really have is God's word and his presence. And one thing that you said that I really appreciated is when was, so you said how to work your measure. All You have to understand, all you really have is God's word and God's presence. And you said, what was the last thing God said to you when you get discouraged, when it doesn't look like you're so called? When people around you don't really celebrate your call or, you know, or this kind of thing. What was the last thing God said to you? You know, when, if you're a pastor and you're pastoring and nobody comes to church <laughs> but your family, what was the last thing God said to you? You know, you're called to preach. Nobody recognizes it. Nobody gives you an opportunity. Nobody opens the platform for you. And you know you're legitimately called to preach. What was the last thing God said? And so now you're discouraged. What was the last thing God said to you? Okay, and then you said, and then I'm saying this, when was the last time you were in his presence? Okay, you're discouraged. When was the last time you were in his presence? Okay, you're, you're, uh, you're tired. When was the last time you were in his presence? The Bible says in his presence is fullness of joy, right? Isn't that what it says? It says that, that, um, that, uh, so when was the last time you were in his presence? You're discouraged, you're in fear, or whatever. When was the last time you were truly in God's presence? And then you said something that is iconic, and that is we as believers can afford to allow ourselves to be distracted. Because if we're distracted, it's going to we're going to forfeit the things that keep us strong and keep us uh, in line with God. And then you said this, you said, you said, uh, discourage or, um, insecurity is dangerous. How true that is. Let me tell you about insecurity. Insecurity will cause you to hurt everybody around you. It will. Cause when you're insecure, you, you put that off on other people. You do. S some of the meanest people you ever see are people that are insecure. Some of, the, some of the nastiest people you ever see are people that are insecure. When people are insecure, they hurt you. They just do. And so you'll notice in ministry, in ministry life, when someone's insecure, they'll come against leadership out of their own insecurity. They come against leadership, and they bring division, and they bring these things, and it's out of their own insecurity. I'm going to share a quick story with you, and I'm going to let you go. So... As a young man, I recommitted my life to Jesus at 17, and it was around the same time there was a move of God. So there was a lot of us young people that were really getting turned on to the word of God and getting turned on to, the, to Jesus. And so uh, there was a young man that was my age, and he was my friend, and I loved him like a brother. We were best friends and the whole thing. He was called of God like I was called of God, you know. He had a supernatural conversion like I had a supernatural conversion and all of these things. And so he, here's this young man and, and I, and we're going to Bible study. We want to go to Bible study on Fridays. We don't want to go club in, and we don't want to do the things that I used to do before I fully committed my life to the Lord. We don't want to do that anymore. So now we're thinking, where can we go on a Friday night uh, for a church service or a Bible study? So he was my best friend, and we were just really seeking God together and all of these things. The guy could teach and preach the word better than most people I've ever heard. The guy could teach and preach that word. There was no doubt in my mind he was truly called of God and truly called to do great things in the kingdom. But because he wasn't secure, 
he was jealous of me. Now, I'm going to be straight, straight with you guys. I'm going to be real. I had nothing on him. This man, this young man, could teach and preach the word circles around me. I had nothing on him. But because he believed the lie of the enemy, he saw me as a threat. And so what happened was it ended up, because he was insecure, he ended up turning on me, hurting me, and uh, our friendship ended up, it ended up deteriorating our friendship. Not only did it deteriorate our friendship, but because of his insecurity, he turned on our pastor and, uh, you know, started turning people against the pastor and all of this kind of thing. And he ended up splitting the church and hurting a lot of innocent people. And I'll never forget the time. Uh, I had worked hard to try to get my family to come to this church, and I, you know, I really was, you know, did a lot to try to get them to come, and so they used to come, and they would come, and then after service, we would go out to eat, and uh, this is when we were having services in a hotel, and so I got my family to come, my mom and her uh, husband or boyfriend at the time, I forget, but anyway, I, he would come, and my sisters would come, and, and they would come to church. Well, one day, uh, there was this I'll never forget it. It was such a painful experience. And so what happened was I come to church, and I'm just like, you know, loving Jesus and all that. And my pastor said, hey, do you got a second? Do you got a second after church to meet? And I'm like, sure, okay, yeah, uh, I got a second to meet after church. And so uh, when service was over, I thought I was meeting with the pastor. I didn't know. And so when service was over, I went to meet, and there was like 20 people. <laughs> and it was a confrontation against me. And I was innocent. I did nothing to any of these people. I did nothing wrong. But this young man, because he was so insecure and so broken, he was able to finagle and work all these people against me and to convince them that somehow, some way, I had wronged them. Well, what happened was, you know, they're all yelling and spitting and all this kind of thing, and it's just, it, I, I, I was in shock. I didn't even understand or know what was going on. And then my, my mom's... Uh, husband came to see what was taking me so long and he saw them attacking me and he saw all this horrible thing happening to me and I'll never forget it I told him go go I'll be there in a second I'll be there in a second and then I went to the car my mother was crying and my mother said I will never go to this church ever again and she never did when I'm telling you if you have insecurities, you need to deal with them. Because if you don't, you will hurt innocent people. If you don't deal with your insecurity, you will alienate people from you. And then you will think you're the victim when the truth of the matter is you alienated them because of your own brokenness and insecurity. Can we be helped? You know, you, uh, 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 you have to understand who you are in Jesus. And value it because everybody around you won't always. Carolyn, awesome job. Awesome word. Awesome word.